just talking about uh, what an elder, and as we look into the scriptures, what, how the Bible itself talks about elders. And then we're going to look at uh, single pastor versus an elder-led church. Uh, and then one more thing on the end. At that. So um, let's begin with the word of prayer, and then we'll actually begin. Father in heaven, I thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ, who is our focus. The very reason we're here is because of our unity and spirit that you have provided for us by dying on the cross for our sins, by drawing us wonderfully to yourself, by opening our eyes to the truth, by saving us, causing us to be born again. And then you placed within us a desire and hunger for the word of God and a desire and hunger to come to church to worship you in truth. And that's all we want. We want the truth. We are committed to truth. Um, and nothing, nothing else will do. Um, so as we study this here on eldership, leading a church through eldership, I just pray, Father, that you would help us to understand it, that this is the way that the Bible teaches. We may not be uh, just taking a stand on something because that's historically what we've done, but because this is what Scripture teaches. I pray to it. Guide us through our time here together now. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And by the way, at the end, we will open for discussions because I think that there will be probably some questions that you'll throw at me as we go through here. And, and I'm sure we'll have time at the end uh, to do that very thing. So an elder-led church, on the first page, you'll see that, that they are the ones that are leading the church. I think it's pretty clear with Paul's letter to Timothy. Uh, let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor, especially or particularly those who labor in preaching and teaching. So if, if, they're, if the elders are ruling, well, what is it that they rule? Um, and I think that also as we get into it later, we're, not, we're talking about not an, a single elder in the church we're talking about an eldership team, but I'm going to get into that a little bit later to show that that is the accurate way to do it. But, but the Greek word that's, that's translated rule means to be ranked first or stand first. And um, the church is not to be, clearly the church is not to be ruled by a congregation, but by those whom God calls for that task. Now, there are churches that function with the congregation uh, really being the authoritative and ruling body. And I, my very first uh, pastorate, uh, that was the case, <laughs> was the congregation. And every year they voted whether to keep, the, keep a person as a pastor or not. And uh, I, on the, after the first year, I survived the first year's vote I don't think I was going to make it on the second one, so I left. <laughs> the, um, the pro the, there's a lot of problems with that. Individuals wanted here have come to this church and wanted to make it uh, as a congregationally led church, ruled church. And they were very adamant about it because basically I guess that's the way that Southern Baptists function. And they wanted us to have all the books open as far as where has the money gone, uh, where are the receipts for everything, open for the congregation to see everything uh, <laughs> that is happening through the money. And if you're, if, if you're going to demand to do that, what's the point of having deacons and individuals, uh, a team of leaders that watch for that themselves? Why would you need to do that as a congregation? And can you imagine if your congregation ruled the discussions that come up in these congregational meetings, they are nightmarish. I've been there. They will talk about the color of the walls. They will argue about the color of the walls here. We just, you know why these colors are the colors they are? We said somebody that's a specialist in interior design say, you pick the color that would go best in here. And that's what she did. And that's why we have what we have. 
we didn't have to bring it before the congregation, right? Now, me personally, I would have liked a nice blue in here, you know? I would have. <laughs> no, actually, actually, mine is a nice shade of tan. My, my, my wife's dad, his favorite color, his, he said, was a nice shade of tan. That was always his comeback. But, but there's, there's always argue, arguing about things. And that's so uh, the deacons in our church, the deacons put together a budget. The congregation votes on it, right? And, if there's, and, there, and when they put together a budget, if you have questions about why this and why that, you can talk to the deacons about it because we put that out there several weeks before we vote on it. If you have questions about it, that's fine. We want you to. And the congregation votes on it, but not every nitpicky thing that comes along the way. And the congregation doesn't select who is going to be the lead pastor and vote on him every year. But anyway, this is the way that, that it's obvious. Let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor. And right there is basically, if you look at the context, it's, it's about double pay. It's talking about double pay in there. Worthy of it. That doesn't mean they're going to get it. <laughs> it certainly means, though, it means they're worthy of it. But no, I don't think any of them actually get it. And number, uh-oh, I number these bad. Number two, plurality of elders. Acts 14, 23. And when they had appointed elders for them in every church with prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. Now, I'm going to go further into that later, but, but here it's obvious. Um, th these are the apostles. They went around and in the churches that they had been evangelizing. They also went back and appointed elders for them in every church. That's plural in every church. And by the way, there was only one church in these cities that they went to. I mean, they were going out there and they were doing evangelistic work. And there was one church in each of these cities and they were um, appointing elders in plural in the church. I think it's very clear that the plurality of elders, and it only makes sense. The scripture itself says uh, two are better than one, and three makes a strong cord, right? Uh, just, and all the disciples went out, uh, minimum two by two. You never let them go uh, one by one. There's just so many problems that can happen if, if you have one uh, elder or one uh, top pastor. Okay, number three, that, or 2B, is teaching the church. The, the elders are to preach and teach. That was the expectation. They labor in the word and doctrine. So in, in the, the, the passage we just looked at, laboring in it. And I, and I love the word laboring in it. Laboring in it means it's, it's work. It is hard work. Preaching is hard work. Uh, I know individuals, uh, you, gotta be, you cannot go into this, uh, I'll mention that in a minute, as a business. I mean, this, I know of uh, an individual that uh, was ahead of me, a couple years ahead of me. I'll give you his first name. His name was Dan. And uh, in Bible college, and he got out of Bible college, and he happened to come to Arizona, and he came down here, and he was part of a family that basically ran the church. And when he came back down here to Arizona, he went into the church as the pastor of the church. That's what they wanted him to do. The family sent him there to become, to learn to be a pastor. And he came back down there, and then I happened to meet him. When I came to Arizona, uh, two or three years later, I met Dan at one of the pastoral meetings and I said isn't it great to be able to preach every Sunday and he says yeah if you like a term paper do every week and uh, that's the way he said it you know I said whoa you know he doesn't they his family had put him in a position he really didn't care for it was what he is now is something that he loves to do he's a chaplain now um, he doesn't have to prepare something every week uh, and so uh, it just fit what he wanted. The way that he was built, it fit for him. Me, I want to labor in the Word of God. When I quit Bible college, when I got, didn't quit, when I got out of Bible college, the reason I didn't go on to seminary was because all the extra stuff you have to do to get your degree, besides studying the Bible, lots of stuff. 
my, I, I just, Pastor Joel is tremendous in what he has done to stick out something like that. Because he didn't like it either. And, uh, but he stuck it out to get his degree. I got out of it because I wanted to study the Bible. And the, and the four years I was at Bible college gave me the foundation to keep on studying the Word of God. And I have been for the last 50 years. I am in the Bible every week. Uh, that's why I always want to be teaching something. I always want to be studying. I always want to be learning something new. I always want to be putting something together for me and then for us. So that's the way that I do. It's laboring, and it's labor intensive. And you can't pull out your notes from college, and you can't pull out your notes that you had for previous sermons, or you can't pull out the notes from somebody else preaching and take their notes and read it and then, and then think that you're doing a good job in teaching the Word of God. You're not because you haven't labored in it. You have to labor in the preaching and teaching. And when you come up with something after you have actually labored in it, then everybody is blessed, including yourself. Number three, praying for the church. James instructed those in the church who were sick to call for the elders, plural, to pray for them. And so, and you remember why deacons came along? Because the apostles were to give themselves what? To the word of God and to prayer. You give yourself to word of the God, to the word of God and you pray. You have to, uh, pastor has to pray. If a pastor isn't a praying pastor, he's not functioning as a pastor should be functioning. You got to be laboring in the Word of God, and you have to be praying. In the first church that I was, and I was only there for a year and a half, but uh, but but I learned a lot from what expectations were. They expected me, and there was only maybe 20, 25 families in the whole church. They expected me to every six months to be in their house, to come visit them in their home uh, to make rounds because that's what the previous pastor had done for 25 years. He, he was in there and he went from home to home. He would go in there, he would be, they'd have a meal together. And so um, uh, that was their expectations was lots of visitation, uh, but that's not my cup of tea. My cup of tea is studying the word of God, which is what the Bible tells me I should be doing, and giving good messages for people and praying then for the people, finding out, but not this constant flow of having to visit uh, families, but if families are in need, of course, of course, somebody, somebody is hurting for something, of course, but just to maintain this flow of expectations, that was wrong on them. But anyway, praying for the church, that's the expectation. Caring for the church, shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. How many of you know of, uh, people that are in the ministry, there are pastors that are domineering over those he's in charge of, right? Uh, this is the way I said that you're going to do it, right? So they're not, But this is exactly what you're not supposed to, you're supposed to be caring for the church, um, which means that you have to be an individual that can take people through very difficult things. Then you're going to have to be doing some difficult things too, and you're not, you cannot be a prideful individual uh, yourself, and and um, exercising oversight, but not under compulsion, but willingly. In other words, you can't do it as a job. It can't be your quote unquote job that you've chosen. Um, so, so this involves g giving oversight and setting the godly example. Okay, number five, church, set church policy. Uh, then it seemed good. This was at the Jerusalem Council, one of my favorite passages. It's to the apostles and the elders with the whole church to choose men from among them to send to Antioch after they had come to a conclusion. Uh, a couple of, couple of three men there leading among the brethren, and they sent this letter by them. So when they were working on the thing, it was with the whole church. They had an issue going on, and so the, the apostles and the elders met with the whole church body. They were meeting together, and they were going through, and they were discussing this thing. And they came to the conclusion. 
And then it says the apostles and the brethren, they sent a letter. And the letter says this, the apostles and the brethren who were elders to the brethren in Antioch, which is everybody, and Syria and Cilicia uh, who are from the Gentiles, greetings. So it shows here that everybody was involved, but the authority, when they sent the letter out, says the apostles and the elders. That's the, who has the, the authority in the church at that time were the apostles and the elders uh, of the church, but certainly the body should be involved in the decision making. Um, why? It's in the major decisions, the whole body should be uh, involved in it. Making major decisions is a process. It's a process. You're trying to come from here and here, and you're, kind of, you're trying to come to something right here. Here's the decision we're coming up with. And so we work on it, we work on it, we work on it, we work on it, and we've come to this conclusion. Now, if we work on something, because it, it was difficult to come to this conclusion. It was not easy. And if you have individuals out here, elders, that have come up and finally come up with this conclusion and said, this is what we're going to do, um, then how, and you're going to be greatly offended if you don't agree 100% with it, aren't you? How did you come up with that conclusion? Well, it was a process, and you need to trust the elders. Yeah, but I, don't, I would not. I, don't, I disagree with that. I disagree with that. Well, we're the elders, and we lead the church. So, you see, it would be ridiculous for elders. So, I'll give you an example. Um, I don't know if this was an elder-led church or not, but there, I know there was several pastors and assistant pastors, which is practically the same thing. They came up with this decision. This was a church that was King James or New King James. Okay, I mean, they prefer the King James, but it's okay if you use the New King James. And that was a type of church, and they were hymns only. This, this is basically where we were 20 five years ago, okay? This is where we were. And uh, they made a decision for the church. They just up and one Sunday said, we're switching to uh, the NIV to be our main preaching and teaching Bible. And we are also going to bring in contemporary music uh, that we're going to be into our worship service now. And we're going to bring some contemporary instruments in. They made that decision. Well, all, all of that would have been okay. I'm not so good about the NIV, but all of that would have been okay if they had brought the church along. They had come to this conclusion. Now, when you come to this conclusion, what does the congregation need to know? How did you come to that conclusion? But if they'd have been involved in the pro okay, so if they'd have been involved in the process, because sometimes you don't want everybody involved in the process until you do come to the conclusion, but you got to go back to where you were back here when you were way out here. You got to assume that a, a lot of people are out here too. Let's bring them in the next six months or year together so that they can see how we came to this conclusion. If this is the conclusion you as the elders or the leadership have chosen to be. And of course, within six months, that church was shut down. It was. It was shut down within six months. I can tell you, I still, I still remember the church. Um, number six, ordaining elders. It's also that elders ordain other elders uh, with what they did back those days. It was kind of a council. It was a laying on the hands of, the, uh, of, of other el elders, Presbyterian. Uh, and generally, the church is also involved, and that's exactly the way that, that we do it. Okay, page two, the single pastor, elder-led church. Uh, I started the church here at Maranatha in 1991, and then in year, and then we bought this property in, in 1997, I believe, and in 1999, um, two. Two of our deacons, a deacon's from, from my church and a deacon from Southeast Valley Baptist Church, 
uh, which Pastor Joel was pastoring for like six months, they were best friends. And they said, hey, we're, we're, we're just alike. Okay, I want to tell you something. I was a Baptist pastor in a Baptist church. Pastor Joel was a Baptist pastor in a Baptist church. And uh, we were both pretty independent in the circles that we were in. We ran in circles. And as a matter of fact, we were in the same circles, basically. Um, but he was way more high spread out than I ever was or will be. So I'm a Baptist church. The deacons say, hey, we're just we're practically alike. And I'm saying to myself, nobody's like me. I'm a, I am the head pa lead pastor of the only pastor of our little congregation we have here. But I don't think that's the way the scripture says it should be functioning. I, it should be functioning with an eldership team. Um, and I've been trying to get at least one man to come alongside me to be an elder along with me or a co-pastor along with me and uh, for a long time. And it, and it didn't work. And also, I was not right niche conservative, which is the circles that I ran in and the circles that Pastor Joel ran in. Most of them were over here in the right ditch, okay, meaning ultra conservative about everything. So the deacon said that, and they said, uh, why, why don't you two pastors get together? And I said, fat chance of that. <laughs> I said, I know, because I, I know the, the church that planted Southeast Valley Baptist Church was over here in the right ditch, <clears throat> ultra conservative. And I said, no, 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 no way. And... Uh, but I said, yeah, but I told the deacons, well, well, we'll see, we'll see. And then, of course, Pastor Joel calls me up. He says, I hear our deacons have been talking. I said, oh, brother, yes, they have been. Uh, let's get together for a coffee and talk about it. Uh, I didn't want to do it, but you know Pastor Joel, especially at 32. He was 32 and a ball of energy. And uh, he's not quite the ball of energy now. He's still... A far more go-getter than than I was at his age. Let me tell you that. So anyway, so I'm 50 and he's 32, and he says, "Let's get together for coffee." I said, "Okay." So we went and met together, and uh, he said, "I hear deacons have been talking." Yeah, I heard that too. And uh, he said, "Well, let's talk about that." He said, "I said okay." I, Pastor Joel, I have got 10 questions I want to ask you. Uh, which I knew what his answers were going to be. And uh, so I asked him the first question. And <laughs> you have to know Pastor Joel. I, he's not quite this way today. But back then I said, okay, here's my question. He said, well, how would you answer that, Gary? And Because uh, he wanted to get a feel for where I was so he can come back with his answer, you know, to kind of be in between maybe a little bit. And I said, no, 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 no. I'm not going to give you any of my answers to these. I want to know how you stand on these issues. And so I had 10 questions for him. I go, uh. and I did not know. He wrote, he was writing a book called The Pyramid in the Circle or Pyramid in the Box or something like that. But it was about leadership. And it was about eldership leadership is the way he believed, even though he was a single pastor over church. And also, he wasn't this conserv ultra conservative like I had assumed he was because of his history of where he'd gone to Bible college and his history of the church that planted the church that he was the pastor of. So I went through that and I go, oh, I cannot believe it. We agree on all 10 of these. And uh, boy, I went home uh, that day and I actually cried, didn't I, Jennifer? I cried and I said to Jennifer, we're going to merge with this church, and uh, we're going to be part of Southeast Valley Baptist Church because we needed each other at that time, and now we were an elder team. What I had always been dreaming of, and now at least two, now we were. And then within a couple of years, we got a couple more on there. And um, so that's the way our history comes, and this was all back in year 2000. 
Um, where do I want to stop off at? Okay, let's go. Let's go down here to the break uh, in here. Yeah. Well, again, that is a that was a process. You don't just say we're going to merge, and I did not. But what but what we did, we talked about it. We sh I showed them the advantages of it, and then also what what Pastor Joel's believed and what I believed on these things. And then I said, and we had already talked with our deacons about it, and the deacons had agreed to it. And you have to remember, we were a small church, too. We were 60, 70 people uh, in the church by that time. We'd been over 100, but now we were, had, we were back down, just like every church does. They go up to fill their capacity, then they go back down. <coughs> um, but then Pastor Joel spoke at my church, which was Maranatha, uh, two Sundays in a row. I spoke at his church two Sundays in a row. Uh, the churches agreed to merge, and the deacons from, three deacons from my church and three deacons from Southeast were now a board of six deacons, and then the, after the first year, they elected a board of four deacons after that. And so it worked very smoothly. And because Pastor Joel and I really were, my, my congregation was used to me preaching the same thing that Pastor Joel was preaching and teaching, and vice versa. So that's why it went so smoothly there. And also, I was determined to be a tremendous supporter of Pastor Joel as the lead pastor that we call, as we call him the lead pastor, which I want to get into which I've got to have to hurry up here. Um, Timothy was put into position as a, wait a minute, am I on page two? Oh, oh, oh here, i got to hurry now. I talk way too much. Elders, I want to go down to elders should come from within. Um, and when they had appointed elders for them in every church with prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord. So they were, the elders came from with, they went to these churches, they found the, what they considered men that would be able to be elders in the church, and they elevated them to the elders in, their, in the church. Uh, from Miletus, he sent to Ephesus and called for the elders of the church, plural, and he said to them, take therefore, take heed to yourselves and all the flock over which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he has purchased with his own blood. Um, I think my point on that is I don't know what. They were overseers, I think, was one of my points on there. I wanted to point out on that, too. They come from within, and they're overseers. Paul and Timothy, the servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Jesus Christ were at Philippi with the bishops and deacons. Um, again, um, you know... I'm going to get to that in a little bit. With the bishops and deacons. And the bishops and elders are the same thing as bishops and when sometimes it says bishops and deacons and sometimes it says elders and, and deacons. And then uh, for this cause, left I you in Crete that you should set in order the things that are wanting Timothy, or is this Titus? This is Titus, Titus and order elders and ordain elders in every city as I, have, as I have appointed thee. I must have been the King James here. And so you are, I, we appointed you, Titus, as an elder. Now you are going to appoint others uh, in every city that you're coming into. But you go in there and you find elders from within the church and they become that. Uh... The plurality of elders never mentions a super elder to be chosen to oversee the other elders. If anyone's a super elder in our, ch in our church, it would be Pastor Joel because he's the main preaching pastor. However, Pastor Jeremy sets the agenda and leads the elder team meetings, and, and, we, uh, and we attempt to hold bi-monthly that we attempt to hold, hold a couple times a month. And so the super pastor, if we would call him that, but he's not, is, would be Pastor Joel, 
but Jeremy still leads our team together because he's by far the more, most organized one of all of us uh, that's there. Uh, is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over you, anointed him with oil in the name of the Lord. Uh, of the Lord. No super elder mentioned there. Okay, elders and overseers are the same person, um, and they're given certain responsibility. Now to page three, you know, it's like part of this. There's no hint in scripture. It's the bottom of page two of anyone claiming to be the pastor of a church and assuming a position of oversight apart from this and superior to the work, whole work of the whole elder team. Uh, we read nothing of a senior pastor or preach presiding elder. And I think such titles, in fact, come close to blasphemy since Jesus Christ himself is spoken of as the chief pastor. We like to call Pastor Joel our lead pastor, the one who is worthy of double honor and has been in that position here for almost 25 years, actually 23 years. Actually, yeah, about that. And the lead pastor cannot overrule the elder team leadership of the church. He cannot. He does not. He doesn't attempt to. And as a matter of fact, uh, he comes in with suggestions. We talk about things, and then we come to a, con a, a conclusion together. We come to a consensus together on decisions here in the church. It does not say, as many would say in his position, no, this is the way I, I would like for it to be done. Well, I, it shouldn't be, I don't think it should be done that way, Pastor, uh, because this is this. Well, may, you may be right, but this is the way I want it done. Now, that's not what, what, how an eldership team should be working, right? An eldership team comes to a, a consensus together, and then they go forward with it. Um, the Apostle Peter confirms that the terms elders and overseers refer to the same persons and that their work is that of pastoring the flock. Uh, feed the flock which is among you, taking oversight thereof, not by constraint but willingly, we've already read that, not for filthy lucre but of a ready mind. And the not for filthy work, Lucre does not mean that they are not paid, and some churches will not pay their uh, pastor or the elders in the church, and they say, no, this clearly teaches that they are not to be paid. It doesn't say that. It doesn't say, uh, but th they're to give the oversight and be elders. They're to do it willingly, not to make money, though. That's not the purpose of it. They're, they're not to look at it and say, oh, I can make a good living at doing that. That's what this is talking about. Um, so when we read in Ephesians 4.11 that God has given some as pastors, literally shepherds, can we not assume that this refers primarily to these elders or overseers and not to one man office about which the rest of the New Testament is completely silent? They don't talk about um, that at all. As a matter of fact, if you look on the very last page here, uh, page four here, there's the episcopos is, occurs seven times uh, in the Texas Receptus Greek. And the New King James uh, translates it, this uh, down through here is what we took this out. However, the ESV translates episcopos as overseer every time and the only time and the 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 new king james and and the king james translates it bishop um, but the purpose of the bishop is the overseer and the same duties are given to the bishop the over the overseer and the elder they're all given the same thing they're they're mentioned together uh, each one of those are mentioned together along with the deacons, which is one spe specific thing that we're going to deal with next week. And uh, you'll notice here that <laughs> for some reason, uh, the New King James translates it bishop all the way through until they get to 1 Peter um, 2.25. Uh, and now they call Jesus the shepherd and overseer of your soul. So in, in, 
it's kind of interesting how they switch that back over to that. Uh, now back to page three. Timothy was put into a position as, let's see. Okay, Timothy was put into the position as an elder bishop pastor by a group of elders. They recognized in Timothy that he was a godly man that loved God and walked faithfully and a good teacher that God would use in Ephesus. Paul reminded him of that in 1 Timothy 4.14, right? And then after taking, talking about elders being a, accused of misconduct and how to handle that, Paul tells Timothy in the next verse. Now, I don't have this in the hand, I want to read it. Um, grab my blue Bible, letter Bible here, 1 Timothy 5.17. First, Tim, five. Okay, and then verse 17. Let me read this. Oh, I don't want to do it in the King James, though. Okay, I guess I'm going to do it in the King James or NIV, so I'm going to do it in the NIV. 5.17. I want to read this through for you real quickly. The elders who direct the affairs of the church well are worthy of double honor, especially those who work in preaching and teaching. For Scripture says, Do not muzzle an ox while it is treading out the grain, and the worker deserves the wages. Do not entertain an accusation against an elder unless it is brought by two or three witnesses. But those elders who are sinning, who are sinning, you are to reprove before everyone so that the others may take warning. And I charge you in the sight of God and Christ Jesus and the elect angels to keep these instructions without partiality and do nothing out of favoritism. And remember, Timothy... Because, uh, you know, you got to be careful on el elders. Do not be hasty in the laying on of hands and do not share in the sins of others. Keep yourselves pure. So the point there is, I think that, um, number one, yes, there needs to be multiple elders, but you can't go into that too fast and just say, okay, you're an elder and you're an elder. Oh, I think you would make a good elder. Why don't you come on our... No, you can't do it quickly. You have to be very careful on who you bring on board as an elder. It's a, it should be a process. We, we make it a process here at the church um, as we do this. The, the next paragraph, the point to be fixed clearly in the mind from these several passages read is that the New Testament churches were never shepherded by one man, whatever his title or designation, but by a plurality of men. Further, the clear impression given by the scriptures is that elders were generally raised up by God from within the local church, not hired and imported from outside, and certainly not from the ranks of a professional clergyman put in place by a ruling board that says, okay, you're going to be the one that's going to go over here and pastor this church, and then two years later you're going here, and then three years later over here, and then one year later here, and moving around. That's not the way the scripture says that they're to be done. That's not the way elders or overseers are to be part of the church. Which brings me to this. The process we use to bring pastors, pastor, oh wait, no, before that. Which brings me to this. Yeah, I cannot help but believe that the present day pastor search process, complete with resumes, salary, negotiation, trial sermons, and the like, is an offense to the very spirit of God. I think that's, I think that is terrible. As a matter of fact, we used to have in our constitution until seven or eight years ago, uh, when we just happened, as we were working on our constitution, we came to that passage, I said, w and that we were going to leave it in there that, that it, when the pastor becomes vacant with the lead pastor, that there would be a, uh, a, a committee formed from uh, the deacons, uh, two or three deacons, somebody from the, ch a member of the church, 
and an, and, uh, an elder, and th they would go out and uh, s do a pastoral search. And I said, I don't think that's the way <laughs> that the Bible would have it be done. I, I argued that it's what should be done is that the elders, whoever the current elders of it, when it comes time that we need another lead pastor, so to speak, preaching pastor, teaching, Bible preaching, teaching pastor, uh, when it comes time that we need one of those, the elders do their own searching. The, the elders pray for God to bring the right man on board with us, and the elders make the recommendation to the church, this is who we think would, would should be our next lead pastor, and then the church body votes ye or nay on it. Of course, and so it's a process, right? It's going to be a process, um, but it needs to go through because the one thing that's for sure, you have to be very careful who you bring on as an elder, as a quote unquote the preaching pastor, because nine out of ten are not going to be like Pastor Joel, <laughs> which is who we need, which is one that says, well, I know guys that you think it should be this way, but this is the way. It needs to go. I'm the head elder here. I'm the lead pastor here. God has put me in this position. Uh, it's my responsibility. I'm responsible for the whole church body here, not you. I'm the one that God has called, not you. So this is the decision I'm going to make. And, of course, I've heard that plenty of times down through my life. Um, and so, uh, but... Of course, that would be hideous to Pastor Joel, and, but most of them that you would say are great pastor teachers, most of them that you would bring in here would want to dominate and say, this is the way I really want it. You guys need to get on board with me on this. And so here, which brings me to this. The process we use here to bring Pastor Stephen and Pastor Jeremy onto the elder team is a perfect working of the compliance to the scriptural teaching, the way that we did it, right? They came on, um, on board. They were here for a year or longer. We saw them in teaching positions. We saw their life that, uh, that they were living. Um, we saw all of this that was going on before they ever, and they, they even came in and assisted us in, in elder meetings uh, before they ever became an, an elder uh, with us. That was from within that the elders wanted to have that person in. And this is how we came up with Pastor Jeremy. He came from within us. As a matter of fact, uh, I've told you this before. I was the first to jump on board with Pastor Jeremy. I said, when I found out, because Pastor Jeremy was going in this direction with his life, and then I found out he wants to be a, 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 a preaching, teaching pastor. And now he's going to school to do that. I go, that's what his gift is. Of course, that's what <laughs> I knew that was what his gift was anyway. But now he was going in that direction. And I said, wow, I, Pastor Joel, I think we ought to really focus on seeing if Pastor Jeremy might be the next um, lead pastor here, preaching, teaching pastor here. And uh, how soon do you want to retire? <laughs> And uh, that was like three years ago. We talked, I, I had that conversation with Pastor Joel, and then we talked to the other elders at the time, and they agreed. Jeremy, so that, then we brought him before us. This is our plan, the elders' plan. This is what we, but now Pastor Jeremy is on here in front of you, and he's going to be teach, and, you, and you're going to have a chance for five years to say, is this the man we really want to be the lead pastor in our church? Right? That's a great way to do it, rather than get somebody in here that's that now the whole apple cart has been upset of what we built on for 25 years. Questions? Comments? Yeah. Yeah, it's not, a, deaconesses are wonderful, and, and the, Deaconess means female servants. Um, deacon means male servant. There was, there was actually offices are because 
this often elders and deacons are put to, put together, and the apostles went out appointing. I mean, the apostles said to the church, "Get yourself some deacons, a group of deacons. You need deacons that will rise up, oversee things that we have a need for in the church." That was the purpose of the deacons. There is a group of specific deacons that the church chose to be deacons. Everybody is to be a deacon, however, with their lives a servant of God. Whether you're male, whether you're a male or female, which is called deaconess uh, from, from scriptures, either either one. You're, but the office itself is is not there where they're appointed by the church. That's the that's the difference, and um, so that's not part of the leadership team. No. No. So, so, but what the deacons are to do, and they're going to talk about that next week, and so I don't even want to talk about it now. You see, the spiritual one is right now, but we're out of time. And if, if anything, people want to get to the food. Father in heaven, thank you for this time together and to be able to be uh, discussing this topic. And I just pray that uh, we are all in agreement on, on this. And, Father, uh, I just pray that you would uh, help the elders to be spiritual men, leaders, good leaders by their godly walk, their walk with you and their outward display of godliness and their teaching clearly the word of God and accurately the word of God. Thank you for this body of believers we have here. To you be all the glory, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Thank you, folks.